So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Guilherme Correa. I'm a professor with uh, the Federal University of Pelotas. And it's my pleasure to welcome our, our guest, our speaker for this afternoon. Uh, he is Simon Niklaus. Simon is a research scientist at Adobe Research, where he's working on video processing and novel view, view synthesis. He received his PhD at Portland State University in 2020. And his dissertation topic covered novel view synthesis in time and space. So uh, Simon, thanks for joining us here at DPVSA. Um, and the floor is yours now. Feel free to share your slides and talk to us. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the introduction and thank you for having me. Let me make sure this works. Slideshow. Can you see the slide? I hope so. <laughs> Let me go back and check. Okay, I'll assume that uh, you can see see my slides. Where did the slide go? Okay, here we go. All right, let me get started then. Um, my name is Simon. I'm gonna give you an introduction and an overview of my recent work on video frame interpolation. If you would like to learn more about me, you can go to my website, sniklaus.com. Um, while I'm a research scientist at Adobe, uh, the, the opinions expressed here in uh, just my own, they don't reflect the opinions of my employer. And uh, with that, let's take it away. So videos, you're pretty sure you all know that videos are just a sequence of frames. And if you show them in rapid succession, they give you the illusion of a motion picture. And the task of video frame interpolation is given two frames, just figure out what's going on between them and estimate uh, and frame in between two frames. And in this illustration, the task would be just doubling the frame rate from 24 to 48 frames per second by hallucinating one frame in between each existing frame. But this is not like uh, the only way you would use frame interpolation. You can also, of course, interpolate more than one frame at a time to get more higher frame rates or to just do frame rate conversion. So let's say, for example, you had like a 24 frames per second video which is typical in Hollywood, but you had a 60 hertz screen, then you could do like a, a conversion from 24 to 60 hertz to match the refresh rate of the video, uh, the frame rate of the video to the refresh rate of the screen that you're viewing it on. And oftentimes, video frame interpolation results are short as slow motion, or sort of also. Oftentimes, they are short as slow motion like this. Um, it's probably going to be difficult uh, to express this. Um, via my screen share, because the screen share is probably going to drop a few frames here and there. So if you want to see actual results that don't look like there's a few frames missing, I'd recommend you to just go to my website and just click on one of my video frame interpolation papers. And there's usually a video at the bottom that you can just watch a supplementary video that has video results. And that is probably a bit of better representation. Um, this thing that I just showed here is just uh, coming back to Hollywood. The Hobbit was shot at 48 frames per second instead of 24. And the reason for that being is that uh, Peter Jackson was of the opinion that it just gives you better immersion in the video because the 48 is more lifelike than 24. And the motion that he makes here is like he's making like a square because he said that the, v, like the v tests that they did is that the people that watched The Hobbit in 48 frames per second, the test shoot said that there was like a whole cut in the screen and you were able to watch the real life instead of just a video. And there's uh, some research going along with that where people uh, did EEG measurements of brain waves of like a video and the higher the frame rate, the more similar the brain waves were to um, like brain waves as if you looked out of the window. But I'm not a neuroscientist, so probably better to watch uh, to read the paper if you want to learn more. Anyway, the history of frame interpolation is pretty long. Um, like if you look at this paper, it's one of the earlier ones. The bottom left, it's probably difficult for you to see it says 2000. Um, what I find interesting here is that back then, we we're looking at um, not pixels, we were just looking at blocks, just like in videos, um, like video compression, um, probably because it's easier to handle. 
pixels as group of blocks in terms of performance, like efficiency, than in individual pixels. Uh, just frame interpolation isn't just limited to like videos necessarily low. Here is just stereo footage. It's from Kitty. Kitty is a uh, is stereo videos. Like they put two cameras on the top of a car and just drive around. And you can just uh, apply stereo either uh, the frame interpolation on stereo footage, and you can get now your synthesis results, which I find fairly interesting that you can just do that. Um, and aside from that, there's also research that looked into using frame interpolation for animation in betweening. So imagine you're making um, a hand-drawn animation and hand -drawn animations are really difficult. Like they, they take lots of time. And wouldn't it be nice if you could just like only draw every other frame. And if you only draw every other frame and then you interpolate the in-between ones then you just save half the work. Um, that's the, like, the wish of this paper. Um, the problem itself for animation in between is pretty challenging because uh, there's lots of flat textures. So it's difficult to know where does which point go to. And also the motion in animation tends to be pretty large. And that's what this paper investigates. There also is uh, research on video frame interpolation in the context of video compression. So the idea here that this paper proposed was, um, let's say we have two iframes and we want to encode a P frame. Can we maybe just like not encode the P frame at all and just do frame interpolation? And the paper extends this one step further. It's like, okay, let's maybe just encode like a tiny little bit that helps us do the interpolation and then just do in, get like this guided interpolation basically. So that's what we see here on the right in this illustration is doing the uh, compression of the video for the P frames. We just uh, try to encode like a little bit of information as little as possible that helps us with the interpolation. Um, like for example, if the interpolation is otherwise, uh, like sometimes the interpolation gives you like perfectly fine results, but in challenging cases where motion is large, for example, might not. So this encoded feature, this encoded vector might help with these challenging cases. Other applications include um, creating um, artistic motion blur. So motion blur, not all is not always like uh, unwanted. Sometimes it's like meant, it's intended. So you can see the bicycle on the left. Um, like an artist or photographer might want to show the bicycle with motion blur to give the impression, like in a single picture, that there is motion. Um, what you can do is straight up on the right. If you have like a sequence of uh, a high frame rate, frame rate sequence, you can just blur them, like average them, and then you get like this motion blur. So, but if you don't have the high frame rate sequence, you could try to do the frame interpolation instead. And another example would be video frame interpolation in the context of event cameras. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about event cameras. They are up and coming. And the idea of event cameras is instead of just taking a frame every like fixed interval, you just, um, the pixels kind of fire when there's change. It's what is illustrated in the top right, like the camera move, moved, and therefore, like over time, like these pixels fired. So it's a different representation of video, and people are already looking into frame interpolation in that space as well. Um, you might wonder why don't we just always shoot high frame rate videos? Um, it's because that it's like a lot of information, and then also the exposure time if your sensor is low and that means that there's noise and all these things. So this paper looked into what if we had like one camera shoot at like a high frame rate, but a low resolution, and have another camera shoot at like a low frame rate, but a high resolution. And then maybe can we combine those to have like a high frame rate, high resolution video. Um, we can also use frame interpolation in the context of rendering. Um, this is a, for example, if you think about Pixar and Pixar, you can find online that they often state that it takes like long to like in the long CPU and nowadays I guess all the GPUs will just render a single frame in a video. Uh, I don't have it in the top of my head. It's, it's probably way more than seconds, might be minutes, if not even hours. So similar to this animation in between from earlier, what if we don't have to render every single frame what if we can just render like every other frame, interpolate the missing ones? And in this rendering context, you have also the benefit of 
you can feed your interpolation algorithm not only the colors, but also depth information, or normals, or albedo, and also the motion vectors. I mean, if you know the scene geometry, and you know the camera moves, you know the objects in the scene move, you, know, you, you basically have the perfect ground truth optical flow. But then CAT is not really optical anymore, it's just like motion vectors. Yeah. Another project that uh, we looked at recently was, what if you just have two similar frames? Uh, so when I take pictures, I often take a sequence of frames so that I have like a sequence of frames to choose from. And I can just choose the frame that I like most to share with my friends and family. Uh, but that means that I have a lot of similar frames, so like these ones maybe. And the question is like, can we combine those two into animation with 3D frame interpolation? And the answer is yes, we can do that. So I hope that you can see that animation comes across via the screen share. Um, some more results on that. So you can get some really nice results just by applying frame interpolation on just pairs of images. The challenge is here, like usually with frame interpolation, the challenge is the higher the motion in terms of pixels, like between two frames, like optical flow essentially, the higher the optical flow magnitude, the more difficult the problem becomes. Um, and that happens if there's lots of motion, if the resolution is high, or both, um, or if the camera moves a lot. So uh, using two frames as input, and you wanting to like get like an animation like this, which it's just like one of the challenging scenarios because there's lots of motion in terms of pixels. If you'd like to see more results of this, um, it's called Project In Between. We presented it in 2021 at Adobe Max. Adobe Max is like an Adobe conference. But if you just search for project in between Adobe Max, you can see the full demo of this. So let's go into uh, my work on frame interpolation. So the first thing I'm going to present is video frame interpolation with adaptive convolution. This is a paper that uh, I presented back about five years ago at CDPR. And just let's go back to the basics. Let's say we have two frames like these two. And these two frames, um, you can see that things move around, and we can try to uh, estimate, or like uh, track these pixels. Like, okay, um, this pixel here on the top right, this, this pixel here on the top right of the box in this frame, keep my mouse still, is a little bit higher in the next frame. And we could try to estimate this motion, and this is done via optical flow. So well, you can see the, the blue. Blue means according to the color coding on the top right, because we have to color code it because it's a 2D vector. It means it's moving to the top left. And that's exactly what we saw in the image before, or like in the, or the animation before is that the box moved, like the top tip of the box moved to the top left, like a little bit up and left. And what we can do with this information, we can, after the motion estimation, we can do, can do motion compensation. So specifically, we can, if we know how a pixel moves from frame one to frame two, we can try and kind of try to trace the path across time and interpolate a frame in between. But the issue with that is what if that it's not a pixel correspondence, but a subpixel correspondence, because usually you won't find like, like usually the pixels don't move in integers, they usually move like in floats, and then the correspondence might always not always be the ideal. Or even more severe is what if the pixels entirely missing in the second frame, which happens if just because of occlusion, like something might occlude a pixel because it moves in front of the pixel. Um, so instead, in this paper, we propose to just treat the problem like this, that let's consider I'm a pixel in the intermediate frame, the one that I want to interpolate. And I know that the information that is me is going to come from a region that is co-centered around my location at I1 and I2. And what I can do is I can just, just try to find coefficients um, that I then filter image one and image two by. And then I get the color information that is me, that picks in the center. And we call this adaptive convolution. Um, so it's like a spatially varying convolution. Um, so e for each pixel, for each pixel on the output, we try to find like the filters for the input. Um, so it's quite a lot of filters, um, but it works and it's like a unified framework for motion estimation and compensation. So instead of having two steps, it's just one step now. And the way we estimate these kernels um, is using a convolutional network. It's what uh, I guess everyone would do nowadays. Back then it was not as clear, um, 
but nowadays it is. Um, and to train a new network, we need training data. So back then we just downloaded uh, Creative Commons licensed videos from online and then just sampled sequences of frames from those, specifically just sequences of three frames um, to input frames. And then the, the one in between those three input frames would be the ground truth that we withhold. And then we would train a new network and we train it with two loss functions actually. So when we give an input to the new network and it gives us the kernels and we apply the kernels and we get like the output pixel or like output frame, um, then we need to come apply, enforce the loss function between the estimated result and the ground truth. So in our case, the uh, withheld um, center frame in the frame triplet would be sampled from videos. And um, let me compare those two. And the trick that we did here in this paper was we can apply the filters not only to the color space of the image, we can also apply it to the like other domains. So for example, we can um, apply, uh, I guess, like an applation on the image to get like the gradients of the image. And then we can filter those. And then we can compare not only the estimate color and the ground truth color, but also the estimate like um, Laplacian space and ground truth Laplacian space. And by doing that, you actually get like higher fidelity in the image. So this is with the gradient loss, and then this is without just color loss. So by also working in this uh, Laplacian space, you kind of trick the network to estimate higher fidelity results instead of like slightly blurry ones sometimes. Uh, one thing that I found interesting in this paper is that you can actually visualize what kernels were used to interpolate a specific frame, and you find that they will be edge aligned. So here this pixel is like on a diagonal edge from like top left to bottom right, and you can see that reflects in the um, filters estimated for synthesizing this pixel. So they, they learn to be edge aware. And you can see also they're like slightly off center. I put my mouse in the center here. Um, and the, them being off center means that they are compensation for motion. So they are doing motion compensation because they are off center and they are, they are motion estimation because they're off center and they do motion compensation um, by like sampling pixel on the edge. And this pixel, for example, doesn't have, it's not a long edge, but it has motion. So you can see it's also off center, but it doesn't have like this edge aware type of thing. Like it's um, just a single peak. And then this one is also an, S and an edge again. You can see like the kernels also are an edge, so it's sampling from an edge again. All right, uh, some results. Because we are estimate doing uh, motion estimation and motion compensation in a single step, unlike these methods at the bottom, you can see actually like here in this region, we are less subject to these types of artifacts. So here in the bottom, we used like a reference algorithm for, um, like these are all flow-based. So they just estimate up to the flow and then do motion compensation using a heuristic algorithm. And we used like a reference algorithm back then and that reference algorithm apparently introduced these artifacts, whereas ours didn't. If you would like to see more results, I'm not showing more because probably we have the screen share, half of the frames will be dropped anyway. You can just go to my website, go to this paper and look at the supplementary video. Um, the issue with this method is that for each pixel that we want to interpolate, we need to estimate lots of coefficients. So in this visualization alone, it's five by five, 25 times two, it's 50 coefficients we have to estimate. And 50, like this is usually not enough for a practical application. Because you can imagine if like a pixel moves more than, like, like if, if I need to get information from something that is more than like two pixels away from where it used to be. Um, so basically if there's like motion that is more than like just a few pixels, I won't be able to, copy information from that area. So another way, in other words, like these uh, areas where I sample from to synthesize this pixel, they need to be as large as possible so they can estimate, compensate for large motion. So let's say we have like uh, 10 by 10, which is also still too small. So ideally you probably want to have 100 by 100, but then you have like 10,000 coefficients for each input image. So it's like uh, 20,000 coefficients. And that becomes intractable pretty easily. So instead, um, we worked on this paper on video frame interpolation for adaptive separable convolution. And they presented that at ICCV shortly after CDPR. So the idea is like, again, like these kernels should be as large as possible, but they grow really big. Um, 
So why don't we just approximate them through separable kernels instead? So it's much more tractable, the problem. And by doing it, uh, it not only gets faster, so you can see on the left, like it gets an order of the magnitude faster just because it's way uh, quicker to estimate these fewer kernels. And also it gets better, um, I guess, just because the, because the network doesn't have to estimate that many kernels anymore. Uh, now we can like do a better job at estimating the few that are left. Uh, interestingly also is that um, something more common nowadays as well as initially this previous paper that I showed you, we were limited to estimating one pixel at a time because of the number of coefficients involved. Uh, so we couldn't just like insert two frames and then get all the coefficients and apply those because those amount of coefficients are just too many. We had to do it like in a, uh, so we call it shift and stitch implementation. I can't read the paper for more details, but in the end, you basically had to run the network multiple times in the input image, I think 64 times to get the full output. And during training, we just operated on single pixels. Um, but if you actually estimate full frames, you can then be again, more interesting in terms of loss function as you do. So on the left, you can see um, just a color loss function, just L1. You just take the two images and you do an L1 loss on those. Whereas on the right, we do a perceptual loss. And the perceptual loss that we're doing here is uh, something that's also well known by now is you just uh, take features from a pre-trained network. So for example, VGG, and then you compare, instead of the image, you compare like the image in color space, you compare it in feature space. And if you do that, uh, you kind of trick the network into learning more high frequency details. Uh, hypothesis that I have to, in this regard is that the features might be a little bit more shift invariant. So if the color is like if the texture that you're estimating is like off by like half a pixel or so, you might get a high penalty with just like an L1 loss. But if you use a feature loss, um, you might have a little bit of shift invariance. And then if you're producing the correct texture, but you are just off by like half a pixel or a pixel, you're not as penalized as much. Um, because of the, um, the nature of this problem, we also did use a user study. We did this in the previous paper as well, but um, just wanted to em emphasize it here that because of this feature loss, interestingly, um, the quantitative matrix, uh, the qualitative matrix, like if you just like quant quantitative matrix, if you just look like the P's now, for example, it's interesting that it tends to be better uh, if you use the L1 loss. So if you just look at P's and R or SSIM, you get better um, um, results by using L1 loss. But as viewers, like as, as humans, we actually prefer the one that is trained with perceptual loss because the high frequency details are there. But those results tend to be worse in terms of P's and R than the L1 trained model. So it's kind of interesting. So since then, I kind of tend to always use two result models, like one that is good in quantitative benchmarks and one that is just gives you just better results because it has more high frequency components. Uh, so essentially this paper was taking the adaptive convolution approach. It's called Niklas et al. We had just two separable kernels that improve the results already because it seems to be a simpler problem to track. And uh, because of the perceptual, like because we estimate full frames of just like one pixel at a time, we can apply a perceptual loss. Um, we revisited this idea recently in 2021. Uh, it's just like a pet project of mine. So like after four or five years, I was like, can we just like improve this a little bit further? Because overall, I like this idea of adaptive convolutions. Um, since, that, since then, they've also been used for many other tasks, for example, for the blurring or the noising, you name it. It's just like this idea of spatially varying kernels to apply to the image is very powerful. So I just wanted to revisit this idea. And um, on the left, you can see the results from the method we did in 2017. On the right, you could see the results from state of the art from 2021. Um, you can see the flamingo lag uh, is be, is able to is interpolate well with the state of the art in 2021. But with our uh, adaptive setup convolution approach from 2017, it's not interpolated well. Uh, but with subtle improvements to that method from 2017, we can then again get better results. And 
there is uh, quite a few subtle improvements here and there. I'm just going to talk about one of them, which is the kernel normalization. It's also the one that gives the biggest benefits. You can see plus half a dB is pretty significant. And with these, like quantitatively, you can see like there's this middle barrier benchmark online. It's actually for optical flow estimation, but they also have a frame interpolation section. Um, you can see that from like the 2017 method was like an average rank of 48.9. And then with SEPCOM++, which is just these subtle improvements, but overall the same idea, we were able to jump like 40 places. Um, so what are these subtle improvements? Again, I'm just going to go into one, which is this one, this common kernel normalization. So you think about, again, about what the network needs to do. It needs to estimate these coefficients. Um, of these kernels that we then, these spatially varying kernels that we then apply to the input image, um, input images. Uh, and if, like, let's say you estimate that you want to like apply Gaussian blur, um, you all know that once you estimate the Gaussian kernel, you need to normalize it such that it all coefficients sum up to one. And the reason why you do it is because you don't want to make the image brighter or darker. Um, and for the initial approach for uh, uh, these adaptive convolutions for frame interpolation, we just let the network estimate the coefficients and let the network figure it out. But that we had to learn that it needs to estimate coefficients that together sum up to one. Um, and instead, what we're doing here is we just take the kernels and we just divide by the kernel, like sum of kernels to normalize it implicitly. And by doing that, you get like a significant improvements in terms of quality. So like on the top right, you can see the loss during training alone. It's like, it's, it's nice to see that the loss all of a sudden gets much better already. Um, the other tricks, um, they're all just like details and I don't wanna go into too many details in this talk. So feel free to just look at the paper. Um, but let's go back to the formulation of adaptive convolutions. Um, I mentioned earlier already, you want these patches that you were filter as, to be as big as possible because you want to be able to account for as large motion as possible, possible. And I also mentioned already that the larger the resolution of a video, usually the larger the motion in terms of pixels. Um, so if you like double the, like if you have the same content and you double the resolution, then all the optical flow vectors will be twice as large. And that will make the problem more difficult. So ultimately this problem formulation is like really interesting because it combines motion estimation, compensation to a single step. But uh, the issue with it is that you are kind of limited with the amount of motion you can handle. You can just like, let's say you have like 500 pixels motion, which might be happening in 4K footage or 8K footage. Then these patches need to be like 500 pixels too. And that just seems to be like, like, I don't think we can approach that. So while well, this works well, it, for like many cases, it, uh, for like the future, like for 4K video, 8K video, for footage, lots of motion, this is kind of limiting. So uh, we looked into a different approach instead, we'll call it called context array synthesis for video frame interpolation. So a common pipeline for video frame interpolation is, again, this motion estimation and motion compensation. So you can do flow estimation and you can do spatial warping. Um, you can do it uh, just taking one frame uh, or one optical flow estimate. You can estimate the optical flow from frame one to frame two. And then you can scale it by a factor of T, let's say 0 0.5, because you want to have like halfway, the, like the, the frame halfway between frame one and two. And then you warp this and like one algorithm for warping, you can, for example, read the uh, Middlebury um, update flow benchmark paper. They present one of these algorithms that does exactly that, and you can synthesize the immediate intermediate frame. You can step it up a notch. You can estimate the flow in both directions, like from frame one to frame two, from frame one two from frame one. And then you can warp um, both of them, and you can do some kind of blending combination of them. Nowadays, this blending step, you would typically do this with a new network. Like if you have two results that might be good in certain areas, whereas in others, um, you could try to just combine the best of the two and you can try to learn that using new network. Uh, so now here's the novelty of our paper. 
if you do this in color space, what stops you from doing that in feature space as well? So let me explain. If you have a new network that tries to combine these two color frames, um, you are not giving it as much information as you could. So if you wall by pixel to get this, these two, to get these two frames here. Um, the wall pixels will miss information about the context that they were in. So for example, you don't know anymore whether a pixel was on an edge or not. But that information might be useful to you if you're trying to synthesize the result by combining those two intermediate results. Because then if you know that initially this pixel was on an edge, it should still be on an edge. And that information is gone if you just do it in color space. Um, because for example, for a random, like you might have like optical, um, inaccurate optical flow and you might warp the pixel wrong and might no longer be looking like it's on an edge. But if you also like extract a feature space from the input image and you warp there too, then you not only have the color of the pixel, but you also have like what was the pixel surrounded by before it was warped. And that information tends to improve results quite a bit. For training data sets, um, you can see that there's now a difference now making a reference. VD frame manipulation uh, has become more and more popular. Uh, and with this popularity nowadays, there also is a standard benchmark uh, frame, uh, sorry, standard training data set from a friend of mine, Tian Fong. Um, and Tian Fang basically sampled Vimeo, uh, 90, Vimeo and extracted, uh, together with his intern, uh, extracted frames from uh, Vimeo, uh, from Vimeo, from um, like this video platform, from Creative Commons licensed videos, as far as I remember, and just sampled triplets from those videos and made those publicly available. So nowadays, most people that do frame interpolation use a standard benchmark data set. And that just makes things more comparable because otherwise, if I present you an algorithm with better results, but I don't use this data set, then you might argue it's like, hey, you might only get better results because your training data is better than the training data that was used for these other methods. Um, nowadays, I don't have this in my presentation, but nowadays there's also uh, other data sets, for example, uh, I think it's called X, from a the paper is called XVFI, I forgot what the data set was called, but they collected like high resolution um, low frame rate, uh, high frame rate videos. So they took a camera like uh, Blackmagic has those, for example, where um, you get high resolution and high frame rates and they went up around and captured videos using those. So there's also other frame, uh, other data sets nowadays. Um, so going again to the history of these different approaches, you can see with each improvement, like if each extension of this pipeline from the naive approach to estimating both, uh, warping both frames, blending them, to using new networks to combine intermediate frames, to also using the context, you can see it gets better uh, significantly. Like, I mean, this is from the most naive to the one approach to the one we have proposed. It's like 2.9 dB, that's like huge, really significant difference. Um, you can also look at uh, standard benchmark data sets. Again, this is the Middlebury benchmark. And you can see we improve, like we get um, better average across the board. Uh, the nice thing about these optical flow-based um, approaches is that you usually get arbitrary time frame interpolation for free. So an issue with another issue with this adaptive convolution approach is you don't really have control over what is the intermediate time that you uh, want to interpolate at. If you just make a slow motion, it doesn't really matter um, because you can just do recursive interpolation. Like let's say you have two frames input, you can estimate the one that is halfway in between those two frames, and then you can do like divide and conquer, and then you like just estimate the inter result from the first frame to like the one that you just interpolated, and between the one that you just interpolated and the second frame. And you can do just this recursively, and then you can estimate many in between frames. But what if you are just interested in like a frame? the frame that is at t equals 0 0.1 because you're doing like a frame weight conversion, for example. You're converting from 24 frames per second to 60, then you can just estimate the well, frames that are halfway between input frames. You have to do something else. 
So if optical flow analyzing is you just scale your flow by different amounts and you usually get this attribute, this attribute for free, that you can interpolate more than one frame easily um, and at arbitrary time steps. Coming back to this pipeline, um, I simplified this a little bit. There's this spatial warping and spatial warping uh, is not always easy. So there's two types of warping usually. There's backwards warping and there's forwards warping. Other names for these operations are gathering and splatting. So for backwards warping, that's called gathering. You just look at what a pixel points to and you then copy the pixels, the information from the target where that points to backwards to the origin. Um, and that uh, is easy -ish to differentiate. To, like, you have to make it differentiable to be able to plug it into a deep learning, um, learning network pipeline. For deep learning, you have to have like the gradients because otherwise it doesn't work. And computing gradients for a bilinear for um, backwards warping is fairly straightforward because you can read the spatial transformers network, for example, it does the math for you. Forward warping, it's not as clear, and also there is um, ambiguities. So if two pixels map to the same location, um, like if two things spare to the same location, for example, because of occlusion, like let's say you have like static background, so the motion of that is zero, and you have a moving object in the foreground. So let's say a move foreground object moves in front of a background pixel. Then like, you, will, you will copy the original pixel, like the background, to this location, and you will copy the object that's moving to the location. So you have a conflict there that needs to resolve because of the occlusions. Um, and that makes the problem challenging. Um, so when we worked in this context device synthesis network for video frame interpolation, we didn't yet know how to make the spatial warping fully differentiable. So basically, we were able to train this half here, but we weren't able to train this half. And uh, that's really what you want, though. You really want to be able to train the optical flow estimator in combination with the synthesis. Like, you want to estimate motion that works well with your compensation of the motion. And you also, you don't want to just, like, what are good features? We couldn't answer what are good features of what is a good context to extract from the input image but then gives you information that is beneficial for motion compensation. So in this table, we tried a few different like off-the-shelf like filter banks, and we just found one that worked well. But like, why can't we just also like learn that filter bank? Why do we have to like predefine it? And the answers to those things is because of spatial warping, we did not differentiate it. So in this paper, we looked at how can we make this step differentiable? How can we then, like, like if we make it differentiable, how can we turn this end pipeline end to end, basically? So idea, motion estimation, motion compensation, we looked at this before, um, but this step is not easy to differentiable. Um, so what we can do is we can start with a basic operation, which we call sum uh, summation splatting. So we take every pixel and we just split it to the target and if multiple things split, split to the same location, we just take the sum of it. So we don't address the ambiguity at all. Just like, okay, two things map to the same location, let's take the sum of it. And that's why you can see things get brighter here because more, there's more than one pixel. Um, so because we just take the addition of the color values, it will just get white because it's like two times like something gray is gonna be something white, two times something greenish, it's gonna be something white in the end if you add enough of it because it just gets out of the bounds of the color range. And we also show to um, do the back, the, the grain of this, um, how to compute the grain of this. Uh, so we basically, we can implement this in a deep learning framework, given an image or two images, uh, given one image, so given an image and the corresponding flow, we can create the results you see on the right in a fully differentiable manner. But what does that bring us? I mean, I don't want my image to look like that. I don't want these white speckles. It's not looking good. But we can use this summation splitting operator, and this is um, just uh, abbreviated by the sigma operator here. This is soft. Uh, this is summation splitting, and what we can do here is, for example, we can just not only split the image with summation splitting, but also split uh, once. So basically now we have like the splatted image and we have a splatted image 
where we take the sum of the country, like how often does a pixel contribute to this base slope? Like how often did that happen? And then if we normalize, if we divide by that, if we divide by the splatted color and by the splattered, like um, how often did we splat to like this cut, like this pixel, and we divide by it, then we get average splatting. So like now at least like it looks, you don't have these white outliers anymore, but you're not resolving the ambiguity. You can see that the car in the foreground is occluding the background, but it's not just occluding it, it's taking the average. So we need to be able to find a way to integrate like uh, an importance mask. So let's say for this importance mask, um, we just take the depth of the image. This is what you would do in rendering. Um, the depth is just like how far is a pixel away from the camera. We know that the car is close to the camera than the background. And let's just say that if we had depth, which we won't estimate here, there's a paper that actually does this, but this is a, it's called a depth of frame interpolation. Um, but here we'll talk about how we compute the, this mass, uh, this um, importance metric yeah, um, later on again. But let's say we have like this importance metric that tells us a pixel is more important than another pixel, therefore it should be drawn in front of the other pixel. We could just try to linearly weight the entire thing, just instead of here, like instead of splatting just once for the normalization, we could splat, we could multiply our image by the importance, like the more important the pixel is, and like basically the more closer the camera is, for example, um, the higher we value it. And so let's say the foreground, let's say the car pixel here has like an importance of 10, and the background pixel might have an importance of one, then uh, the predominant color will be of the foreground of the car, and it will ideally occlude the background. You can see it doesn't it does it a little bit more perfectly. You can probably try to find better parameters, like you can change your important matrix scale a little bit um, to get it look better. But the issue with this linear splatting is that you're not shift invariant to the metric. So let's say you had like this important metric, like let's say one and 10 again, like the car is 10, back is one. And let's say you just add, you just add a thousand to it. So then it's a thousand, one and a thousand, 10. And then if you take that as the importance metric, then they're gonna be averaged again. So this linear splatting metric is not uh, shift invariant. And then this is our contribution here. We um, basically uh, take ideas from softmax, the op softmax operator, and here's the math in the end if you would just take x of the um, importance metric and you multiply with that you have this nice property that if you add a constant to the importance metric z then it just removes itself it just disappears again so like now we have like a an important like a way to forward war pixels to spat pixels in a differential manner um, while also like we have to incorporate like some metric to disambiguate pixels and we integrate it in a way that where the metric is like shift invariant, we can like add a bias to that metric and it doesn't matter. And we can take this framework, we can take the same thing as before, we take the image and input images, we estimate the optic flow, um, we estimate a feature pyramid now. So previously we estimated context or we extracted context and the context was just one level uh, but now, because we can back propagate the entire thing, we can be more flexible in what we're extracting. We just say, like, let's just extract a feature pyramid. Let's do this warping in the flex splatting in a feature pyramid. And then we have a warp feature pyramids, and then we can have a synthesis network combine the warp feature pyramids. So, in comparison to this context of our synthesis from before, um, we can just extend the context to like a context pyramid, like a feature level pyramid. So we do the warping, not only like in the original resolution, but also multiple resolutions. And uh, because it's differentiable, um, we can train the feature extractor and the image synthesis network end to end. And more, maybe even more importantly, we can also fine tune the optic flaws to made So what does it bring us? Uh, first, let's look at the different alternatives of splatting. Um, so you can see here the softmax splatting performs best in all quantitative benchmarks, better than the other alternatives, um, kind of expected, um, but also verified through this experiment. And then because we can do this differential splatting, we can 
do a feature pyramid and like extract context, a context feature pyramid. Uh, instead of just estimating one level, we can extract multiple levels with walking multiple levels. And as it turns out, that improves the results. Basically, the more levels you extract, the more features, the more information you extract from the input images before you walk them, the more information the synthesis network will have that combines these warp results to the actual interpolation result. And we can do this because it's different, like the splatting is different. And then and lastly, um, we tried different uh, flow networks uh, just to extract the flow from. But what is important here, you can see here this bump of like half a dB between flow PWC net and PWC net FT is when we fine tune the flow network end to end as well. So we can, in the deep learning setting, we can back propagate our gradients through the splatting operator with the domain differentiable all the way to the optic flow estimator. And we can train the optic flow estimator jointly with the rest of the system. We can estimate optical flow that is um, uh, tailored to the specific task. And there's also a paper on task oriented flow estimation. If you want to learn more about like this idea of flow that is trained specific purpose, and then it makes usually the flow better, the optical flow works better that way. Um, when we released this paper, we actually made quite a big bump over all other methods. Um, so we published this paper in 2020, and it took quite a while for other papers to outperform this method. Um, and even nowadays, it's one of the baseline methods that people compare to. Like they usually compare to our adaptive convolution stuff, just because it's not flow-based. Um, and then they compare to the softmax studying stuff, just because it worked really works really well. Um, yeah, and coming back to loss functions again, I, I really find loss function interesting. Um, just showing this example to show you that uh, on the left we have a network trained on a passion loss, and that we proposed, and you can see there's a little blur here in this area, for example. Whereas if we train on a feature loss, uh, it's more high fidelity results. So I would prefer the right ones for like an actual application. Whereas the best ones give us better results for like usual metrics like PSN and SSIM. But Richard Tsang released like a paper a while ago where they work on a perceptual similarity metric called LPIPS. And it's interesting that LPIPS gives us a better score on this image that I would prefer as a human too than this image. Um, so typically what people are doing often nowadays is um, they compare on PS and R and LPIPS. So P's and R is like, okay, if I train my network with a like a color loss, like a knife color loss, like a passion loss or one loss, then usually I get good metrics for P's and R. If I use the feature loss, then usually I get good uh, LPIP scores. And you can also just use out, train on LPIPs. Um, back then we just trained on uh, just the VGG feature loss again. All right. Um, since then, I joined Adobe and uh, at Adobe, we have lots of video products. So as a research scientist, uh, I was like, how can I make my work on frame interpolation more practical? Uh, let me actually go back. I should have edited a slide. Let's go back to this pipeline here. Um, well, this works well. It's kind of limiting still for, let's say, for example, for fake 4K frame interpolation. So why is this limiting for 4K frame interpolation? Well, you have to estimate the optical flow at a 4K resolution. And that takes time. Um, and then you need to apply, like you have to extract the feature pyramids at a 4K resolution, which takes time. And then you need to do the image synthesis at a 4K resolution, which takes time. I mean, running a new network at a 4K resolution, like that's not something that people typically really do. I mean, if you look at applications for new networks, they're usually like working on like a megapixel image, not 4K footage. And not only do we need to work on like 4K footage for frame interpolation, if you work with videos, you have to do that like 30 times per second. So let's say you have like a task where you estimate depth from an image. You just do that once and you usually do that on a low resolution as well. Whereas for frame interpolation, we need to do this several times per second for like, because videos have like many frames we need to interplay between. And we needed to be able to do it on 4K. 
So if you look at this, essentially what we can't do is any of the stuff that is here at the bottom. We can't do this if we want to be able to do this fast. We can't extract feature pyramids and we can't use an image synthesis network to combine results. Just like ex even just like this image synthesis network, running a network on a 4K resolution, that's just slow. It's too slow to do that 60 times per second to have like the hopes of being real-time frame interpolation. So this is the idea that we explored in this paper. How can we do this better? How can we do frame interpolation that is fast, yet still good? And please forgive me that the colors switch from gray to white. I haven't had time to make slides in my prop in my usual color scheme. That's why this is white instead of uh, dark background now. So what we were able to achieve, and I'll direct your attention to the right side first, is we were able to come up with a method that works well. You can see it's performing better than all other methods in this X-test 2K benchmark. So it's a 2K resolution benchmark, and we do so in order of magnitude faster than the rest. And on the left, you can see that our method is particularly useful for interpolating multiple frames at a time. Um, and you'll see in a second why. So if we interpolate one frame at a time between two frames or three frames or seven frames or 15 frames, so this would be basically the slow motion scenario when you want to create a slow motion video, you create like 15 frames in between two given frames. And you can see ours is like maybe two orders magnitude even faster than the competition when doing the specific setting. So how do we, how can we achieve this? How can we be really good while also being really fast. Um, just, uh, just, a, just some quality result again, some quantitative, qualitative result again. Here in this example, this is a 2K frame, um, and there's this pole that is subject to large motion because it's 2K, it's like the motion magnitude is large in terms of pixels. So therefore, like soft splat, the method I just showed you, and also the method that proposes this data set, this x test data set, and tries to perform extreme media frame interpolation extreme meaning on high resolution also fades in the result because ours does it, it doesn't, and we do an order do some order we can do it faster. So how do we how do how can we do this? Um, well we can't get rid of optical flow, so let's keep that in the loop. But we can do something smarter here. So this refers to figure five and this was request to equation five equation five. Equation five doesn't have any parameters in it, just a good equation. And then this blue box Yes, it has just seven chain parameters. So what is this blue box? So what we're doing is uh, basically saying, well, we can involve a new network in like the image synthesis part, in the motion compensation part. Uh, let's go back to the roots. Let's um, come up with a heuristic warp warping algorithm that performs the warping of the input images based on optical flow, and then get us the interpolation result. But let's be smart about it. Like, let's try to think about all the things that are involved in this warping algorithm. And let's have all the parameters involved in this algorithm be learned. Like, instead of me sitting down and trying to tune all these hyperparameters of this um, specific algorithm, there's seven hyperparameters involved in this warping algorithm. Let's just train those. Let's learn those, uh, those parameters. So it's like going back to the roots of like kind of come up with a heuristic algorithm for warping for frame interpolation, trying to um, integrate all the, the um, things that people learned about, or like the people found out about how to do that well, while also training end to end and learning the parameters involved. So the key there is to make this differentiable, like this warping algorithm differentiable, which is not something that uh, previous literature has looked at. Because what happened in the past is we had heuristic warping based algorithms, people improved them, they improved them manually by hand, but then new networks came around and we just like scrapped all of that and we just said like, let's take a new network, let's give it a result, ignore all these heuristic alg algorithms just to do that. And now we're just going back to the roots, we're integrating these heuristic algorithms, but we're making them differentiable. Um, and by making them differentiable, we can train this end to end and we can train the parameters involved so we can get the best possible parameters. And this is figure five. This is our heuristic warp warping algorithm. Um, basically, we estimate um, two metrics, um, a merge met a splitting metric, which tells us basically this is the importance metric, kind of like it tells us how important is the pixel. See here, this are the background pixels, they are dark, so they're not that important. 
which means that these foreground pixels, like the car pixels, are going to be rendered on top of the background pixels as it should be, like we're handling occlusions properly. And then this down here, the merge metric is um, used when we have two, like we bought the first frame and the second frame, we need to merge those two frames, and the merge metric will be used for that. It's like a, like a reliability measure of sorts. And if a pixel is unreliable in the interpolation result, we should probably not use it in the final result. Um, but in the other frame that we warped, it might be reliable. So therefore, we should take that pixel instead. And we made sure that all of that's differentiable. Like um, that is a backward scoping algorithm. It's gathering. It's differentiable. And this is a splitting algorithm. I'll just explain to you how that is differentiable. Um, so what are the nitty-gritty details of the heuristic warping algorithm? Let me see whether I can zoom in here without, yeah, I can zoom in without going to the next slide. Um, well, one thing is that instead of splitting cuts directly, we instead of warp, we split flows, and then we warp the inverse flows. So you can hear the transition where the rim meets the tire. On the left, if you split colors, we get kind of like these the subtle pixel artifacts, whereas if we split follows, like forward split flows, and then we gather the colors instead, that turns out to be a little bit better in terms of like the image clarity. Um, small difference, but small difference, but it's there. And then uh, top right here, it's uh, when we split flows, what we can do is we can do a white split. So usually we split like to four pixels, it's called uh, bilin uh, bilinear splitting. But if we split flows, we can also split a little bigger. We can split like a neighborhood of like a five by five window. And usually you wouldn't do that with color because color would get blurry. But if you split flows, if the split bl flows are blurry, it doesn't really matter that much because you're gonna backwards swap the colors and most will be uh, high fidelity again. And that allows us to like, close some gaps in the splitting results where the flow diverged. And yeah, this is just an illustration of like this um, merge metric. So you can see when we warp, like, we get these stray pixels. Um, and we don't want to combine, like we don't want to have them in the final result. So that's why in the merge metric, they are low, like they are black. Um, and ideally then the for other frame that we warped, um, will be reliable in that area and we'll just take the information from the area instead. And if you see on the right, um, if we take any of these things away, if we don't split the flows, but we split colors, if you don't split white flow, like the Gaussian split, if we don't do that, but we do a bilateral split instead, if we don't use, these are like metrics we use to uh, generate the merge metric and the splitting metric, any of those, gets worse. So any, all these individual carefully thought out things matter for the final interpolation quality. Um, and the nice thing is because this is like uh, fully differentiable, um, we can train the optical flow again. So from this row here, the second row, the third row, we make a bump of almost 2 dB. So because this pipeline is fully differentiable, we can train the optical flow and we can train up the flow that is optimized for a specific task. And coming back to the narrative that I had earlier is basically we make this we make this heuristic stuff, like the heuristic warping algorithm differentiable and learning the parameters of that as well. It also improves results quite a bit. So if I just take the warping algorithm from this reference, um, which is basically that, but um, the warping itself isn't like the parameters unlearned. If we instead learn those parameters, um, we can get it pretty big improvement already. And then another improvement by also trying to do the flow. And then on top of that, there's another trick. Um, we also don't want to learn optic flow, at, uh, estimate the optic flow at 4K. So let me step back a bit. We can now do frame interpolation where the frame synthesis part is just this heuristic warping algorithm. That's great, that's fast. It's basically just copying pixels around in the end. That's why it is so fast. That's why this line here, the green line is so flat. Because we don't, once we estimate the optical flow, and we can interpolate novel frames in between two frames really easily because we just copy pixels around because of this heuristic warping algorithm. Um, but we still have to run the optical flow and we don't wanna run the optical flow at 4K resolutions for two reasons. A, it's slow. And B, if we do that, usually uh, 
the inputs will kind of be unusual for what the network was trained on. Like the network will be given inputs where the flow is hundreds of pixels potentially, whereas the optical flow estimator is usually a training data sets where the flow is tens of pixels, so there'll be a domain gap. So what we're doing instead is we are down something the input frames to a low resolution. We estimate the optic flow in low resolution, which is faster and it's more in, in the domain of what the network was trained on. And then we have this network um, called upsample here, where we upsample the estimated low resolution optical flow guided by the two input frames iteratively. So if we downsample the input frames by four, we basically call this network twice here because each time it upsamples by two. And now if we do this um, on small resolutions, like Middlebury's a small resolution data set, if we like estimate, if you do like half resolution of the flow estimation to two X upsampling, the result actually gets quite a bit worse. Same thing for if we do a quarter resolution of the flow estimation and four X upsampling of the guided upsampling of the flow, it gets also worse. Because Middlebury itself is like just it's a 480p resolution, I think. So on, if the input is small resolution, this is, you shouldn't do this. You should just estimate the flow at the original resolution. But let's look at 2K, for example. Um, 2K, you can see that, oh, let's, let's look at 4K. So let's look at 4K. On a 4K, uh, doing this, like down something to half the resolution, actually gives us better results than doing it at the full resolution. Because now we are more in the domain of the optical flow estimator. So like, not only do we uh, get better results, we also do so faster here on the right. So I can see the runtime of the entire thing on like uh, 4K footage is like only half than if we do this system where we do half, uh, we downsampling it by 2X and then do the guided upsampling of the flow, uh, we get a 2X runtime improvement. So if you have 4K footage, you get faster results and you get better results if you employ the scheme. Whereas like on 2K with a specific example, for example, you still get like similar results, like it drops by 0.4 dB, but you still 2X faster, so you can trade up as well. And because the warping is so uh, fast, I actually implemented it in WebAssembly. So if you go to my web page and you go to this uh, project page for this uh, paper, at the bottom, that's gonna let us load a second for the flow, let me zoom into the page a little bit. If I drag the slider at the bottom, it will perform the, the, the frame interpolation in real time. So this is essentially the heuristic warping algorithm. So what we're doing here is we pre-compute the optic flow. So what we're giving here, given here is the input images and the estimate of the flow. And we just employ the heuristic warping. Um, and this is just a demo to show you that like even in a browser where we run this thing in a single thread and it's like no multi like multi threading of any sorts, uh, we can do frame interpolation in like real time. All right, let me go back to slides then, and oops. that is it from me. Uh, you can see my web page. If you want to look at it, and with that, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Let me stop the screen share. Stop sharing. I think we still have like 10 minutes left or so for questions. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Simon, very much for your, your talk. It was a great talk uh, with a lot of uh, inter interesting works from your your previous uh, contributions to the field. So now we have some time for uh, some 10 minutes for, for questions from the audience. Um, feel free to, to type your questions on the chat or step forward to the microphone zone in front of the stage if you have any questions. If you prefer, you can also type your question in Portuguese and I try to translate that to Simon. Have any any question from the from the audience? Well, while they are probably preparing their questions, <laughs> I hope I didn't I overwhelm a, them. Yeah, I have a short question. Uh, actually, the um, you you showed in your in your last uh, slides in your last works 
uh, some efforts to to decrease complexity and make possible real-time video interpolation right so um, when we are thinking of uh, video streaming online video streaming we are very frequently limited to the computational resources at the at the receiver side for example we don't have gpu on our phone or we have limited memory uh, battery constraints as well so uh, do you think this re real-time interpolation that you just showed for us in your website uh, is possible? I is it working for uh, this kind of environment or very low power environment and uh, limited memory, no GPU, et cetera? <laughs> I mean, why does why can we do this here in the first place? Why can I look at your stream without my CPU screaming that it has to process all this video? It's because the video decompression is baked in hardware. Same thing on the phone. I mean, H.264, I guess also H.265 nowadays. There's dedicated hardware on your phone that takes care of that. That's why we can do it. That's why we don't drain our battery. And that's why our phone doesn't heat up while being on a video call. Um, if we had like a hardware that can estimate optical flow, then you can do quite, like, I guess you can do many things with that. Because like, so for this last uh, project that I presented, this flooding based synthesis, once we have the optical flow, um, we can do interpolation in real time. So assuming that you would have like a hardware unit that can estimate the optical flow for you, then I, wouldn't, I don't see any issues with that. But getting to the point of baking this hardware, that might take a few more years, if not decades, just because we're still making significant improvement in optical flow estimation, and probably it's going to be difficult for people to agree on one optical flow estimator to bake in hardware and then ship in like millions of devices. It would need, a, it would need like a, a change in um, manufacturing and uh, preparing the proce processors for, for uh, making this type of processing uh, available, right? Yeah, and I mean, you can see that already uh, NVIDIA nowadays, uh, as far as I know, I'm an impression of that they're doing that nowadays already, like the newest GPUs, they are shipping hardware accelerated optical flow estimation. Uh, there's an SDK news like in the 4000 series. I don't know whether they are actually baked in hardware or whether it's running on the CUDA cores. But like, there's a, we might see that happening more often in the future. Okay, hopefully. Uh, okay, let's see if we have any other question here. Uh, does anyone? Andre, Andre Brescher stepped into the microphone, so. Um, have you tried uh, training the optical flow at a even lower resolution to see if the, if the upsampling is even more, um, performs even better at higher resolutions? compared to no upsampling? Uh, the question was, please correct me if I'm wrong, have you have a train trained up the flow at a high resolution to see whether it would then perform even better no, than what no. you're doing at a high resolution? No, at, a, at an even, even lower resolution um, to have even simpler optical flow and then mm -hmm. uh, leave more of the complexity to the upsampling module. Oh, like so if we try to improve the upsampling like make the upsampling better and whether we could get them get away with uh, like a low resolution flow estimate um, yes. it's like a chicken and egg problem i mean if you look at optical flow estimation how it's used to be done like this variational approach you defined your optical flow estimation how would you do it and then you applied course to find so every stage in this pattern was the same so there was no difference between like optical flow estimation, optical flow up sampling. It was always the same. Um, so in a way, we could do the same thing. We could try to come up with a pipeline that does the same thing at every single stage. But we didn't do this. We did this up sampling instead because to optimize for 4K runtime. So the, the, the idea is let's like have like um, a good optical flow estimator at a low resolution because the pixels scale quadratically, it doesn't take as much time, and then just like spend less time on the upsampling. And so we try to shift our compute budget away from, the, um, so instead of like doing the same thing at every stage in the pyramid from course to fine, 
we do more at the lower scale because it's uh, less computation demanding and we do less complex steps. We do this iterative refinement um, on like the higher resolutions. That's why we separate it like this. But I mean, if you spend more compute budget on the um, upsampling, on the refinement of the optical flow, then it becomes more towards optical flow estimation again and will get better. Good question. Um, thanks. Uh, is the code for this new uh, splitting uh, work available as well? Uh, I was trying to find it the other day and wasn't able. I'm afraid not. Um, so again, opinion's my own, uh, but since I work for Adobe and since this might be end up in a product, I don't know. Uh, it's like definitely mm -hmm. like it has capabilities of ending my product, but uh, again, opinion's my own. Um, it's difficult for me to open source this because yeah. my employer might not like that. I but you, I had an, you had you might have had an issue with that. Yeah, I had an intern that published that I worked with. Um, we published a paper called "Many to Many Splatting" at CVPR, and because his was an internship, uh, he was able to publish the code on GitHub. And the ideas that they are similar, where we only do optical flow estimation, only do splatting, no like uh, synthesis. Um, so it's similar in nature, just the technical technicality, like the technicalities are different. Um, yeah, yeah. And you also improved a little bit the splatting, right? To fix uh, the mathematical invariance. Uh, yeah, so we did that. Um, so for the softmax splitting, the issue is with the exp in there. Like if you do exp 20, like the numbers get really big. If you do exp 100, it's like probably out of bounds for floating point range. I think it's out of bounds for floating point range, yeah. Uh, so we have like a mathematical trick of like not make it out of bounds, and then we call it stable softmax splitting. Um, that is more likely to be released. I just haven't made it a priority yet. So in the future, mm -hmm. I think if there's code to be released, I'll release the code for the stable softmax splitting. Uh, just so other people can use it, because the softmax splitting actually has been used for many other applications. For example, for in image animation, um, like Alex Zelinsky, he was taking a single input image and then animating the single input image, for example, with a waterfall, and uh, he is using softmax splitting for that. And there are some other applications for softmax splitting as well. So I st the utility is pretty big for this stable softmax splitting operator, that's why. I would like to release it, um, just haven't made it a priority. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, thanks. Thank you for the questions. Okay, do, do we have any other questions? I don't know if we have time for other questions. I believe so, because we have a break now, but the time is still available, I think. Giovanna, do you want to make a question? <laughs> All right, and thank you so much for having me. If you uh, have any questions that you didn't want to ask here, feel free to shoot me an email. You can go to my personal website, snickclass.com. Um, I think my email is just in my resume and just shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And thanks for listening to me. Hope I was able to uh, hey. share some of the joy that I have of video frame manipulation with you. It's definitely getting more popular these days. And, yeah. and have a good rest of your day. Enjoy the conference. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, for your talk and then accepting our invitation. Uh, let's just thank uh, Simon once more. Uh, please press F on your keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for you.